Hi, my name is Dr. David Kampt, and I am with The Dialogue Company, and I want to welcome you to the fifth in our series of weekly discussions about how one uses compassion-based sessions, compassion-based techniques to communicate with people about the election. Today, we're going to focus on bridging the divide with questions. One of the things that so many people are concerned about are is one, our polarization that in our country, it's so awful, it's so divisive, and we really need to do something about that. And at the same time, people want to not only know how to talk across the divide, but they still want to influence people. So what we're going to do today is to talk about a critical, uh, a critical issue, which is asking questions. So I'm going to have a discussion about why and how to ask questions, why and how to listen. We're going to do a, a role play and then we'll have time hopefully to take some questions. So that's our agenda for today. Why ask questions? So imagine a situation in which you're, you're you know you're going to vote and you are talking to somebody who might um, look at the look at the election differently. And what we're suggesting is that what you want to do is to make sure you spend sufficient energy asking questions. So um, we've talked about, if you've come here before, you've heard us talk about the reach method, but just to be clear, we are suggesting a certain, a, a particular approach towards being persuasive, whether it's persuading people to vote who are not voters or persuading people to vote differently a persuasion technique that we promote is something called the reach method. It's a, it's a, it's a number of steps, reflect, uh, which has to do with calming down. We talked about that last week. Inquire, our focus today, which is asking questions. Agree, uh, which means letting the other person know that you, you don't think they're crazy, basically. Uh, confess, tell a story that even further conveys that, and then harmonize to bring that all together. So they can, this is where you try to influence the person, but only after the other steps. So we're going to, that. that's the overall framework of this project. And today we're going to focus on the inquire step. Uh, my partner in crime, in high crimes, important crimes, Karen Tamaris is not, uh, she's a little sick today, so she's under the weather, so it's just me today. So inquire, that's today's focus. So what is important to do if you're trying to be persuasive to somebody is to start by asking questions. It's the, it's it's really important. Part of our natural tendency is to, uh, when we want to persuade somebody, is to start by telling them what we think and what we think they should think. And while that might be a natural inclination, that is not the best strategy for actually influencing people. The best way to try to influence people is to start by asking them questions. Okay. Help them exhale. Now, just to, just to be clear, in the REACH method, reflect means you, you have calmed yourself down and you've gotten ready for the conversation. Now, what you want to do is to start out by helping them to exhale. You've done your own deep breathing work, whatever you've done, but what you want to do is to let them discharge. So you want to ask questions so that they can blow off some of that steam they have about their opinion. Now, they might have it's a strong opinion and they might sense that you disagree with them. So what you want to do is to let them convey what they think. So you can see in our polarized times, people are so wound up, so committed to their position, they feel so unheard that it is very valuable to for you to be and create a sense of atmosphere that you can be heard. Your opinion is not being squelched here. So it might be important even to let them discharge a bit to, and to keep asking questions about like, is there anything else I should know about that? Is there anything else I should know? Because you you want them to feel like you, uh, that they have been heard and that you are curious and you have a broad range of curiosity about what they feel. Now, this means you got to put aside your desire to tell them what they should think. You're going to get, you're going to get to the point where you're trying to influence them, but what you, you want to first give them a chance to just express themselves fully. And you might need to keep repeating. Is there anything else I should know about how you feel until they really feel complete on that? Okay, next. What we want you want to do is to 
um, focus on uh, encouraging their own self uh, reflection. So one of the things that <clears throat> happens is that by asking people about their beliefs, sometimes, if you ask the right question, you can get them to really reflect on those beliefs in a deep way. You can sometimes get them to think about how they came to their beliefs. So and sometimes you ask about that. Sometimes I ask people, so I'm interested in how your beliefs evolved about this. And they and that often is very helpful in having people not just look at their beliefs as static, but, they're, but look at their beliefs as something that have evolved over the course of their life. And that could have it could have gone different ways, and so that is an important uh, th that is an important mechanism to get them to, on some level, challenge their own beliefs by you just asking about the journey of their beliefs. Okay, um, highlight inconsistencies and do so uh, do so gently. So. <clears throat> um, Oftentimes, if you're in a real conversation where you, you're giving the person a lot of room to talk about their beliefs, um, sometimes they will tell you things that are that, that they believe they believe uh, they believe that racism is a problem, and they believe that people over, over, over uh, people make a too big a deal out of it. And so, part of what can be useful to do is to gently um, raise things that are inconsistencies or even tensions in their belief. So, but you want to do gently. You're not, you're not trying to play a gotcha game because what you're ultimately you're trying to do is to um, is to get them to be less defensive. Could we go back one a couple a couple slides? Uh, uh, reduce defensiveness. So, just to make sure that y'all get this point, what you want to do is to uh, wait. Make sure you wait until later in the conversation to tell them. Uh, what before you tell them what they should think that's that's vital no one likes to be told what to think in fact sometimes um one of the things that can be an impediment to your being effective in persuasion is you so much wanting them to believe what you believe that in fact they, they set up it sets up something called reactance well they don't want to change just because you want them to change too much uh, i often analogize it to the butterfly which if you try to catch it in your hand sometimes the wind you reach for it pushes the thing away. And so what you, this, we talked about this in the reflex step, but what you want to do is to have a certain level of detachment to the outcome of your being successful. Uh, because again, no one likes to be told what to think. Okay. If you go down to the um, art of asking questions, that'd be great. Um, so, all right. So there's a certain kind of art to asking questions and you want to work on that. And, you know, you, you have, we all have asked questions, but we haven't necessarily all thought about the art of that. And so what you want to put yourself on is a journey towards learning how to more effectively ask questions over the course of your life. So let's look at it as developing a certain skill. OK, so one of the important skills is almost an attitudinal issue is just being curious. That's cultivating an attitude of curiosity. That's vital. So. What's useful to do, as I said earlier, you want to be a little detached from the outcome of this conversation. But one of the ways to do that is to say, OK, um, I am really I'm going to try to change the person's opinion, but this is only one person. So I'm also going to look at this as an opportunity to learn. So even if they have opinions that are really frustrating to you, what you want to do is to, is to look at this as how can I learn more about this person's point of view? If you care about the person, then maybe what you want to do is to think, OK, this is somebody I care about. And I want to learn. I want to understand them because they have these views I don't like. And I know they're a good person. I want to understand that. If it's somebody you don't know, then maybe you say to yourself, this is an opportunity for me to learn about how a certain type of thinking happens in our society. And I have an example right here. So I'm going to try to use this as, an, as a way of trying to learn about this person as a reflection of a broader phenomenon that I want to understand in society. Next slide. Okay, withhold judgment. It is this is one of the most vital parts of being persuasive. If people feel like you're judging them for your for their opinion, they're really unlikely to change. And given the polarization in our society and we're so tense, it is easy to fall into that. So it is vital if you're going to be persuasive to withhold judgment. 
to look at the person as they're a good person. They care about the world and the country just like you do. They just have come different conclusions. So in addition to being curious, you want to withhold judgment about that. And that's so hard to do. This is why the reflex step is so important to put yourself in a mind frame of, of curiosity and of non-judgment because you're going to be much more effective if you actually are able to do that. Next slide. What you want to do is to ask open-ended questions. Oh, wait a minute. Let's, um, can we go back one? Yeah, open-ended questions. So what's important to do here is to, um, is to try to avoid asking yes or no questions. You want people to talk about their beliefs. You don't want to say, well, do you believe this or that? Or, or don't you think that's wrong? No, you, you, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is to get them talking. Your objective in the inquire step is to get them talking, to get them going on at some, you know, some uh, some reasonable length, not just about their beliefs, but even about the experiences beneath their beliefs. That's that's that can be very important. And I will talk about this in just a minute. You want them. You're not trying to nail them down quickly. You're trying to really get them talking about how they see things. So you're not you're trying to avoid closed ended questions. You're trying to ask open ended questions. Okay. At next slide. Ask, ask what, ask a uh, sign number four, uh, no, uh, issue number four, ask what and how, not why. So the, here's the trick on that. Why questions encourage people to kind of rationalize their belief, to kind of give you the best argument for their belief. But what you want to do instead of asking why questions is asking what they think and then how they came to that belief. What experiences brought you to feel like that? Or when did you first start feeling like that? What you want to do is to get them talking about how their beliefs got formed. You can see how this is related to the thing I said earlier about encouraging them to be reflective. Uh, what, what, what you can do, what, what is the mistake that people often make is to ask these kind of why questions, but not how, uh, which have them rationalize, but not how questions, which have them tell you stories about how they came to those, to their conclusions. Okay. And of course, the last one is elicit personal stories. <clears throat> Ultimately, what's more connective in conversation are personal stories, because it fires up, we've talked about this in the past sessions, it fires up something in our heads called mirror neurons, a, a part of our brain that tries to mimic what we think somebody else is going through. Stories do that much better than facts or than beliefs and that you can hopefully establish a kind of a circuitry through you where your mirror neurons are fired up by their stories, you're gonna tell them stories that can hopefully fire up, fire up their mirror neurons, and ultimately you're trying to leverage that to influence them further in the conversational sequence. So what you wanna do is to focus on personal stories, uh, not just their beliefs. Okay. Now, if you're gonna ask these questions, you need to be in a stance of listening. So how do you do that? What's what's listening to understand? Let's talk about that. So one of the mistakes that people often make uh, is listening to reply. We ask a question, we might be trained to ask a question or told to ask a question that we follow that instruction, but then we're, we're just waiting to respond. We're waiting to reply. We're, we're listening for how we're going to reply. We're not really listening or we're listening partially, but really thinking about like, what am I going to say to this? Not what's really going on with this person and how our how are they putting their thoughts together and what, what's involved in, the, in their mindset? That's what we want to do and avoid the listening to reply strategy, which is so common uh, with people. Okay, next, taking turns speaking. Often people think that listening means like they talk and then I talk and they talk and then I talk. What you want to do is to shift your mindset to where you're trying to really listen to the other person's opinion and understand what's going on that brought them to this conclusion. How, how do they come up? How does this opinion they have fit into their journey? How does it reflect that? So this is about listening. It's not about like they give a lecture, you give a lecture. They give a lecture, you give a lecture. So that's a common mistake uh, in the world of listening. Real listening, of course, it means hearing people, hearing what they say, 
hearing the subtext of what they say, here's what's in between the words, right? To, to listen here, to listen to influences, listen for influences that they might not be talking about, but that you could perhaps glean or surmise and to, and to be attentive to the emotions that they're expressing in addition to what they're explicitly saying. That's, that's what real listening means. And so what we're inviting you to do in order to be more persuasive is to move your listening to a deeper level. Okay, next one. So yeah, you, you got to listen, but you also need to show them that they're being heard. That's also important. So um, it's an exchange you're trying to have. You're trying to you're trying to reach them at a heart level. So you got to show them you're being heard. So let's say I'm gonna say a little more about that. Next slide. Again, um, you, your goal in listening, you want to take in their opinion because you're 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 going to try to influence it, and it's important to understand it. But you want to make them feel like they're being heard. Not you're not just checking off the box of listening. You really want to make them feel like. No, this is a different. This is a different encounter. I'm I'm being heard now. That's important to do. That next slide. One way to do that is to now and then summarize what they've said. So this is the old paraphrase technique. Uh, a friend of mine uh, calls it the powerful paraphrase. Uh, so you might um, Kai Degner. You can look him up. He's like a listening guru. Um, Kai Degner, and uh, he. We refer to each other a lot, and he talks about the powerful paraphrase. This is a way of saying back to the person, I think you're saying this, and, and, and making sure that you have it right, right, to, 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 to summarize what they've said and do so in a way that's concise, that's clear, but they also agree with. Next one. Part of that can be naming their emotions. So you think you, uh, so it sounds like that made you really frustrated. Sounds like that makes you sad. Sounds like uh, you've kind of hopeful about that, whatever that is, right? So they might not have said they feel like that, but part of making somebody feel heard is making good guesses or good assessments of what they feel and naming it and then and then um, seeing if that's right. We'll talk about that in just a second, um, which is give them a chance to correct you. So they they say some things, you summarize, you add some emotion to it. They didn't necessarily say out loud, but you want to say, did I get that right? And you want to really invite them to correct you. Which, and that's another way of making them feel heard, which is to let them know you're not just, you know, you're not just putting them in a box. You really want to you want to make sure that they agree that you have it right, that you summarize their perspective. You've gotten their emotion. Uh, you, you've gotten their emotion. You've summarized correctly. And that, that that shows to them that you are really listening. Okay. So what we want to do is a role play. My typical, uh, again, we're going to have Elena the, uh, uh, help help us out here. So just to, um, it's our first time doing a role play. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. I'm sure it's going to go well. Just, just we'll be fine. Up. We'll be fine. So, um, so just to just to just to just to, if we can show that the next slide again, just to remind people um, of what the what the reach method is. Right. So just to remember, here's what's going on. Uh, we're gonna do. Um, I'm gonna do through all steps. So we drilled on inquire today, but just so you can see how it fits into a larger frame, um, I'm gonna there's the reflect. That's more of a silent thing. That's just me getting ready. Then I'm going to inquire. I'm gonna ask questions about how how she what she thinks. Uh, then I'm, you're going to notice that I'm going to, I'm going to agree. I'm going to let her know that I accept her point of view. I don't think she's crazy. I'm going to find something right in what she says. I'm going to confess. I'm going to tell some story that shows shows her that I don't think that her position is completely crazy. And then I'm going to then after all that, then I'm going to try to harmonize to try to show that I'm trying to convey my belief through a story, and then try to um, influence her by saying she doesn't have to completely let go of everything she believes to come over to my position and think what I said is also true. So you're gonna watch us do that. Okay, so here's the frame of this. I'm gonna take a slightly different tack than we usually do. In this uh, scenario, Elena is an undecided voter and I am a conservative voter. And I want her to favor more of conservative candidates and conservative positions. 
Okay, so that's a, uh, and so I'm going to ask her what's on her mind, and she's going to, what's on her, what you're going to find out what's on her mind is a particular issue that conservative people and progressive people often differ about. But you'll see me do the race, you'll be do the reach method. So again, what's important to notice is that I'm doing the method, right? So this is a role play. <laughs> so we're playing roles here, but um, so I'm playing the role of a, uh, I'm, I'm playing the role of a conservative person, but I'm using the reach method. Okay. Let's All go. right. Hey, Hi, David. Hey, how you doing? Okay, I'm just trying to figure my my voting decisions out right now. Oh, really? Okay. Well, tell me, um, what are the things on your mind about that? About I'm this? really passionate about immigration and comprehensive immigration reform, but I'm not sure which candidate uh, is the best choice for the issues that I'm really concerned about. Ah, say more about your concern about the immigration issue. What, what are you concerned about? Well, I'm really concerned that um, universities and higher education institutions can get uh, international students to contribute to uh, its body of knowledge and its intellectual mm -hmm. property. But there are so many restrictions right now. I'm not sure what is best, you know, if which campaign is speaking to that. Right, right. When did you first uh, start caring about that? How did this come to, to your awareness of it as an issue? Oh, it's a lifelong passion of mine. In fact, uh, my father was an international student, so I'm here as a result of um, international education and exchange. Got you. So let me see if I got it straight. So um, you have a whole family legacy that's related to immigration and part of your, con and, and especially for people in the educational and higher education. And part of what you're concerned about is the fact that we uh, is the idea that we don't have good policies on that. We're kind of we're kind of confused about that. Or are you are the policies too restrictive? They're too lax. So what, what are you, where are you? Uh, what's your say more about your concerns? So I can make sure I got it. Yeah, it's just uh, one. It, the policies are not addressed often or frequently unless it's related to terrorism. So when there are policies, it tend to be restrictive and in the same tone of protecting the homeland and rarely do the policies address all the contributions international education can make to the U.S. Right, right. No, it's, it, it, I, I think I got it. Yeah, it's, it's so important that we have good policies because we, we benefit so much from international, from other brain power from other people in our country, right? Mm -hmm. it, it so helps. It, it, so I hear you on that. It, I hear you on that. And, um, and you know, it's funny. Uh, which you, you talked about the sometimes our policies are so oriented towards um, towards terrorism. Like I'll go even further than that. Like I find that sometimes the way people talk about immigration, it's like it feels like xenophobic. Like sometimes, like sometimes I hear politicians talking about it, and it feels like they don't want immigration because they don't like those people. And and that it, and you know I don't hear that all the time, but I I hear that you know sometimes, and that makes me feel kind of weird. Yeah, thanks for hearing me. I feel the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I so I hear you on that. It's um it's a it's a complex set of issues. Um so yeah, so that's true. At the same time this it's so it's so complex. Like I happen to know of a couple of um like I don't know people in the higher education realm, but let me tell you let me tell you about some things that have happened to me. So I have this uh I have this friend and they have a uh, a housekeeper, and this housekeeper is an undocumented immigrant. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they're, they're a good housekeeper, and they're 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 here, and they got like their siblings here, and some of the the, the, the housekeeper is great, but the like one of their siblings is he's like um, he's often he like he's like a public drunk, like he 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 he's not a contributor to society. Now I'm surprised, you know, because of where they live. He's not being carted off the ice, but he is he is more of a drain on resources. And so that, those all people are undocumented. Now, then I happen to um, I happen to know that, that, that that's somebody who lives in California. Now, I know somebody here and they're like um, they have a brother that has been in the immigration line. Like they've they gone through the proper steps. They haven't haven't immigrated un, un, illegally and they've probably been waiting for years and years and years. And it just and sometimes I think about like, wow, how could it be that these you got these people who are undocumented, 
who some of whom are drain on resources who kind of skip the line in front of these other people who are like following the rules, following the structure, and they're still waiting, waiting, waiting. And I, you know, and, and so it makes me it makes me think that there's there's a fairness issue that we have to think about. Even though sometimes people on people who are against immigration, like I told you, I feel kind of weird about the, the undertone of that. But also I think we need a system that makes sense. And we don't. We got to have something, something orderly, so people are not just skipping the line because that creates a, creates unfairness. Does that make any sense? It does. It does. But it's also very expensive, and you have to look at the motivation to be undocumented. It's a moment where you are risking your life occasionally, mm-hmm. and um, do you have years to wait in line? It, it really depends on the stories, but. I'm just concerned with just coverage about it. It's, it's always negative and never positive. What are the positive contributions? I just haven't seen that from either party. Right. No, I, I hear you. So I, I hear what you're saying. So I guess um, part of, uh, I think that's what you said is correct. I find that true too. But part of, I guess for me, part of what I think about is like the the, the need for us to have like an orderly system like that, because, you know, we don't want, I mean, we got, we got 11 million people in this country who are undocumented and most of them are good people doing good things. But then, you know, you got to ask yourself how many people are, they have, they skipped ahead of, right. Who are, would also be good people doing good things. And they followed, you know, they followed the procedures set up by the government. We might need to change those procedures, but it also seems to me that it makes sense to have um, an orderly system so that, you know, when right. we, when we crank up, we need more immigrants. We can crank that up, and we need less. We can crank that down. But it just seems, if, if we have a system that this is is all disordered, that seems like, um, you know, you you want to know who's coming into your house, coming into your city, coming into your land. It just seems like it makes more sense to have that. So, very true. The yeah. system is broken. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thanks all for right. listening to me. Sure. Sure. I'm glad we could have this conversation. All right. Theme. Great job, Elena. So, yay. So, so I want to invite people to notice what happened, right? What happened is I spent time listening to Elena, listening to her position, and I tried to summarize it. I want to make sure I had it right. Like I did the, I did the, I, I, I gave her opportunity to say no. I even added an emotional component to my summary. Then um, I told her I, on a basic level, agreed that what she, I stated my agreement. And then I went further and reinforced, I told a story about, well, I actually didn't tell a great of a story, but I conveyed my own sense that I hear people talking about anti, the, the, uh, the position. I hear people who they basically, uh, I agree with her that sometimes the xenophobia, that, so I'm basically um, criticizing my own side. I'm agreeing with her perspective that sometimes bad emotions are driving that. So I'm agree- I'm conceding that. It says strategic concessions are really, really important in persuasion to help people relax. So you're not just at odds like that. So I did that. And then I, um, then I, let's see, I, I, I said that, then I, that, that's, that's a confessed step. And all that before I made my point about the need for a more orderly, orderly system and I did so through a couple of stories. Stories are much more connecting than um, than just facts and beliefs. So you saw me do the um, the reach method, uh, and so you can get a sense of how that works. A lot of people, a lot of times, people don't understand that the strategic concession is an important part of being persuasive. So, um, so thank you for we're we're almost at time. So what we want to do is to uh, close things out. I want to I guess thank Elena, of course. Uh, Karen should be back next week. Are, are there any? There's no. There any questions? We got any questions over the transom? We do have one comment, and if you are listening in live, feel free to post your questions. We'll be able to see them in real time. So I'll post one from Sharon. Uh, Sharon, thank you for supporting the show. Obviously, she's a friend of the show. So her comment is, I appreciate all the details about how to create connections through conversations, questions, and listening. Special thanks to Elena. Thank you, Sharon, uh, for taking part in the role play. 
<laughs> could real quick and really get into an issue. Yes. All Sharon right. doesn't know I could really get into the immigration issue. So it was just by chance that David selected that topic. But uh, likewise, the REACH method is a two-way process. Right. right. And so, so, the, so just to, as a bigger picture before we close, the REACH method, we did, a, we did four sessions on, or three sessions on using it to persuade people to vote. And uh, it can be used to persuade people of how to vote. And it can be used by either uh, conservative people or progressive people. It's a basic dialogic method. And we think it's a really powerful one that everybody should think about. Because if we all persuade each other differently, we'd have a much less divisive society. So I want to thank you all so much for uh, uh, attending. And we'll, at the watch, we'll, we'll have a, a watch party. This will be rebroadcast tonight at 8 o'clock. And I will be on hand to answer any questions that come up at that point. Come back for the watch party. Tell your friends about it. Um, and so we want you to get out there and talk to people. Uh, this is an important election coming up. And we need, as Americans, we need to not look at each other as enemies like the Russians want us to. Uh, we need to see each other as uh, fellow travelers in this important and great country. And so we hope you get out there and talk to people using compassion-based methods that are going to be more effective and more healing. So thank you so much. And we will see you tonight and or next week at 12.30 on Monday. So what are we going to talk about next week? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, we're going to <laughs> we're going to focus on, although we did the inquiry step, we're going to focus on agree and confess. So, uh, uh, so the, the focus is on influencing through concession, that agree and confess step. Well, basically, you saw me, you saw me do it. But the point is that if you're going to try to influence somebody, you got to remember ABC, agree before challenging, right? You agreements before challenges. You want to make sure that they, you don't just go in trying to tell them they are, should feel different. You want to tell them, I get how you feel and there's, there's correctness how you feel now. And so the agree and confess steps are all about that. That's our focus next week. Well, thank you for joining us. And now it's the end of our broadcast. All right. <laughs>